So hi everyone, thanks for having me along. Um, I'm Megan and I am what's called a climate consultant at the Met Office, um, which probably sounds a little bit more confusing than what it is. Um, but I'm going to talk to you today about sort of my journey through science and how I've ended up at the Met Office and what my role is within that. So on the slides, I've just got some photos to show you. And that's because I want to show you the broad range of things that I've done within science and lots of different things that you can do. So starting off I, on the top left, I don't know if anyone will recognise this, but this is the, the lighthouse at Plymouth. So that's where I went to university and, and now where I live. And I studied something called environmental science. And it's quite broad range. It means I looked at all sorts of things such as animals and plants, as well as chemistry, physics, lots of different aspects of science with a particular focus on the environment. And I studied this course because from a young age, I had a real enjoyment of nature and being outdoors and I cared a lot about the environment and I wanted to learn more about it. In the bottom left there's some interesting photos of some bugs. I'm not sure if you have any bug enthusiasts among you but I did a placement when I was at university and I was looking at how climate change will impact this particular insect. So the one at the top left this is called Sotona obsoletus so that's the Latin name and this is a weevil and basically it eats this plant on the right hand side. So if you can have a little guess amongst you what this might be, but you might recognize this as clover and farmers use clover in sustainable farming systems. So you might have learned about how intense farming can be on the environment. So one of the things we can do to farm more environmentally friendly is use things like white clover to help improve soil health. So I was looking about how this weevil eats the clover and damages that ecosystem. There's a few other pictures there of me doing some sampling within the field. So there's lots of opportunities to be outside when I was working through science. And right at the top is a very old photo of when I was even younger, when I was doing volunteering um, in my local community, looking at the pond environment and helping to maintain that. There's also great opportunities to travel. So the next photos along is me looking very wet and but very smiley. And when I was in Malaysia, and this is when I was doing some um, a field trip and research in the rainforest. And the bottom left, you can just underneath that is a photo of me and my friend Beth, who is also a scientist. After we'd climbed up a very hot, sweaty hill and mountain to get to the top of this view. So you can go to some really beautiful places to do scientific research. After I finished university, um, I then went on into a job and that's when I became a consultant. So you might recognize right in the middle that these are solar panels and wind turbines. So I worked in a job where I was looking at renewable energy. So this is actually at Keele University not sure where all the schools today are located, but that might be near you if not, sort of mid England. And this is where we're looking about how we can um, generate the energy for the university from renewable resources such as solar and wind. So this is now, um, we did all the planning for this and lots of interesting assessments to make sure that we weren't damaging the environment by putting these in place. And now the university is using that energy um, on site as well as for some local places. After I've done this, I've then moved on to working at the Met Office, which are these photos on the right. So I'd be interested to hear about how much you guys know about climate change and what's going on on the planet at the moment. I'm sure that you're all much, much cleverer than we all give you credit for in understanding some of these things. But my job at the Met Office is to talk to people, could be children like yourselves, but also adults working in different types of industries and teaching them about how climate change will impact them. And to do that, we have these really, really big, impressive supercomputers, and it generates loads of data from us on all sorts of modeling. And then people, very clever scientists do all sorts of coding to analyze this data, which consultants like myself can then use to talk to people about the impacts of climate change. So the photo at the bottom is um, a few of my, myself and a few colleagues, and we did science camp. And I'm not sure if any of the schools online today took part in that, but if you didn't, then I would recommend it for next year. But this is where we'd go into schools and we teach them about climate science. So that's a really exciting part of my job, sharing that information. And finally, something that I do outside of work, um, which is sort of how I <laughs> learned to be with like to be in and today, 
is that I'm part of um, a founding team who are looking to open a climate hub in Plymouth. So what we want to do there is bring in climate science education to the high street so you could pop in with your parents or your friends and learn about climate science and also what you can do about it. So that's a really exciting project and hopefully if all goes well in our little um, hub in Plymouth we might be able to replicate that across um, the UK. So that's a little bit of an introduction to um, my journey through science and how I got to where I am today. Um, I'm going to pass over to Susan now to talk about her role. Um, but if you have any questions about anything I've done or talked about, um, then I'll have you to take those at the end. Thanks. Thanks, Megan. Are you able to move on to the next slide for me, please? Cool. So uh, my name is Dr. Susan and I also work at the Met Office. I'm an atmospheric dispersion scientist, which is another mouthful of a title. So I'll come back to that in a minute. But first, I thought I'd tell you a little bit about my route to the Met Office. So um, I grew up and went to school in Yorkshire, uh, in the city of York. Um, the picture in the top right isn't from back when I was in York because I'm a bit older than perhaps I look. and digital cameras weren't really around, so getting hold of kind of images from that era is a bit more difficult. Um, but I still regularly visit York because my family still live there. So while I was at school, I used to love uh, science. Um, I was really interested in science and also the use of maths in science. So when I left school, I went to university to study maths and physics. Um, and I went up to St Andrews University uh, in the south half of Scotland. Um, and when I was at university at St Andrews, I discovered all the things you can do with maths and physics. So as well as just numbers and equations on a page, uh, we studied things like how you can use maths to describe the sun, how you can use maths to describe fluids. Um, and we also did a little bit of astronomy as well. Um, and what I learned was that the really exciting part of physics and maths for me was using physics and maths to describe the environment around us. So I was really excited to be able to use physics and maths to describe the world and in particular to describe the kind of the atmosphere and the ocean. So when I left university at St Andrews, I decided that I wanted to carry on studying, but that I wanted to focus my studies on, on the oceans. And so my next move was that I moved from St Andrews to Liverpool University in the northwest of England, um, and I moved there to do a PhD in oceanography. So oceanography, just ocean sciences, so the physics of the ocean, um, and the PhD is where my doctor title comes from. So you can become a doctor either by studying medical sciences or by doing further studies in any other subject, in which case it's called a philosophy, uh, doctor of philosophy uh, rather than a doctor of medicine, and that's, that's how I gained my doctorate. So as part of my time at the University of Liverpool, I spent a lot of time modelling the oceans on a computer, but I also had an opportunity to go out on a research vessel, which was really exciting. So in the middle of the screen, you can see a ship, and that's the Royal Research Ship Charles Darwin. Uh, she was actually retired in 2006, so um, she predates the Royal Research Ship uh, Sir David Attenborough by quite a number of years, and she's quite a lot smaller than the Sir David Attenborough. But we went uh, on the Royal Research Ship at Charles Darwin and we crossed the North Atlantic. So in the background, you can see a picture uh, with the UK on the right and America on the left. And the blue track across the bottom is essentially our route across the Atlantic. So because the Royal Research Ship was quite elderly, we, picked up, we joined the ship in Bermuda and then we sailed from Bermuda towards the American coast. Uh, before turning to the east and sailing in a very, very straight line uh, along 36 degrees north latitude all the way across to Europe. Um, and the whole journey took 45 days, so a month and a half. And in the entire month and a half at sea, we only saw land once. So that was, that was quite a different experience. And the picture just below that shows you the sampling unit we use. So this is a, a ring of bottles that are just bottles that hold ocean water and we lowered that ring of bottles down to the bottom of the ocean um, every 40 nautical miles across the Atlantic so we stopped every 40 nautical miles lowered it down to the bottom brought it back up and then we took the water out of the bottles 
uh, and we measured the water for all sorts of things. So we were interested in how hot it was, we were interested in what its salt content was, how much oxygen was in the water, and also how, mu how much biology, how much biological material was in the water. Um, as you'll notice, the picture was taken in the dark. So whilst we were working at sea, it's very expensive to take a ship to sea. So we worked 24 hours a day. Uh, so we worked in shift patterns. Uh, and I was lucky enough to work from midnight to eight o'clock in the morning on my shift. So uh, all the pictures I have from crossing the Atlantic are in the dark. Uh, uh, and this is me and a colleague taking samples from the bottles. On completion of my PhD, I decided to continue working in the field of ocean sciences. And so I moved across to America for two years and I moved to Duke University, which is in North Carolina, um, in Durham, North Carolina. And that's the little red dot you can just see in America. So it's sort of halfway down the east coast of America. Um, I did manage to do a little bit of time out on field work while I was out, while I was out there too, although most of my time was spent modelling the ocean on a computer and looking at changes in the heat contents of the ocean, so how much heat the ocean holds um, over the course of the last 50 years. Um, but the time I did manage to get out, we, we went out on a much smaller boat, so a boat that only goes out during the day, so no shift work, no night watches, which was very good. Um, but as you can see, despite the fact that we were quite far south, it wasn't that warm when we went out. So we were wrapped up quite warmly once we took all our samples. Um, and I was just helping um, the professor on the right to take samples at the bottom because he was really interested in the little microbes that live in the soil at the bottom of the, um, the sound, which is just off the coast of North Carolina. Could you move on a slide, please, Megan? So having completed my work at, at Duke University, uh, it's common in science to, to keep moving on if you're only in short-term positions. So I looked for another job and I found a job at, at the Met Office. Um, this time though, I moved from working with the ocean to looking at the atmosphere. Um, and I also moved from looking at long scale changes. So 50 year changes in the amount of heat in the ocean to looking at things that would only take days and I became an atmospheric dispersion scientist. So atmospheric dispersion is basically the science of looking at how pollutants have moved around in the atmosphere. Uh, and in my case, I'm really interested in where material is transported that's released accidentally. So that might be material that's released in a big fire. It might be material released from a volcanic eruption, and it might be material released when a, there's a nuclear accident. So some of the things I've studied in recent years is I, um, is I looked at forecasts of where the ash from the uh, FFA eruption in 2010 were distributed and how that might impact on flights um, and aircraft. I've looked at big fires, um, there have been big waste fires in the UK and when they burn for days and days we want to know where all that uh, material that's been burnt goes. And then more recently, um, I, well I guess not quite so recently now, but I've also looked at where the material that was released uh, in the nuclear accident of Fukushima in Japan uh, went. And the picture in the middle um, is of me in Japan. And in the whole area around the nuclear power plant, there are now monitors which tell the local people what the level of radiation is. Um, and so we went out there and, and saw those. The picture just to the right of that is effectively what what I do as a science day job. So uh, we run a model, we feed weather data into that model, uh, we feed information about where the material is being released, whether that's the volcano or a waste fire or some nuclear material, and then the model goes away and calculates where that material is going to be transported, which is the lovely colourful swirls, and it also works out where the material is going to fall down back onto the Earth's surface or, or the ocean surface, and that's the grey stuff you can see in the background. Uh, and then finally, I just thought I'd include a picture of what I do in my spare time. So in my spare time, I'm a very keen kayaker and canoeist, um, and I particularly like going out on canoeing expeditions. And so the picture in the bottom right is of me travelling down a river in a canoe with all my equipment needed for four days of a canoeing expedition. Uh, and I'm happy to answer any questions you have. 
Amazing. Thank you so much, Megan and Susan. That was so good. Guys, if you have any questions, write them in the box, in the chat box. I'll give you a few moments to do that and then I can start the questions. I do have a question for you, though, Susan. When you go on a kayaking or like canoeing expedition, like, do you have to, how does it work? Do you just like canoe all the way down for like a whole day and then camp or I don't, I don't know if that's a stupid question <laughs> no no that's a sensible question so if we go on an expedition we put everything in our boat and we paddle down the river um for a day and then we'll find somewhere to camp and depending on where you are sometimes that'd be like campsites so if you went to the river Wye, you'd have to stop in a campsite if you're in scotland you're allowed to camp anywhere so you can just camp on the side of the river where there's a flat patch of land um, the, 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 the one caveat with all this is obviously when you get to the far end of the river you need to go back and collect your car so usually at that point you need to use public transport or a taxi to get back to the to your car. That's really really cool. So guys what sort of questions do you have? They will try answer as much as they can but as we learned last week sometimes you guys think of really great questions that even stump the scientists. Oh, we've got a question from 3J. He says, how many water samples did you take and were there any surprise findings? So that's a really good question. Um, uh, yeah, good question. I, so each time we lowered that big frame of water bottles, it has 24 bottles on it. So we took 24 samples on each time we lowered it. And we lowered it approximately every 40 nautical miles, but when we were closer to the coast, um, we lowered it more often. So I'm afraid that after this length of time, I can't remember exactly how many time, how many samples we collected, but we definitely collected a lot. Uh, in terms of surprise findings, the, the most interesting one, although it wasn't something we'd gone looking for, is that we, when we went to take some water samples from one of the bot bottles, we opened a little tap to, to let the water out at the bottom uh, and a tentacle came out. So we, we'd managed to capture a very tiny little octopus in one of the bottles in, as well as our water sample. Sorry, I just realised that I was muted. Um, we've got a question from Bose as a primary school from 3T. They said, do you find evidence of plastic at the bottom of the ocean? So we didn't go looking for any plastic. So we, we, we didn't look for it in our samples. So we have no idea whether there was any at that point. And three, I keep forgetting that I'm muted. <laughs> and 3T also said, do you find any rubbish at the bottom of the ocean? So similarly, we didn't, we didn't find rubbish at the bottom. There wasn't anything big enough to see in the water bottles. So if it was there, it would have been tiny. And, and again, because we didn't look at it under a microscope, we wouldn't have spotted it. But we didn't see, I think sometimes you see pictures, don't you, in the news of like, you know, masses of waste on the, web, on the ocean surface and you see big plastic bags. Um, certainly we weren't getting kind of plastic bags from the bottom of the ocean. Ah, oh, that's really, so is that similar to microplastics then of what you would find at the bottom of the ocean? So, yeah, so I have no idea if we do find microplastics, because I think for microplastics, we'd have probably needed to look under a microscope um, and we didn't do that. So I have no idea, um, but but kind of physical big waste particles we would have seen, I guess, because the, the, you, know, you can see them with your own eye, but we didn't see any of that. 3J asks, what is worst for pollution? Natural sources like ash from volcanoes or pollution from humans? That's a really good question, guys. That is a really, really good question. And I guess it depends what you're interested in as well. So I guess, I mean, in, in real terms, it's got to be the, 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 the pollution from humans has to be worse because the Earth survives without us and it's quite used to having volcanic ash in the atmosphere. But obviously, if you're flying in a plane, you might not think that, that that's the case because you really don't want to meet volcanic ash if you're flying a plane. Um, it can get in and clog up all the engines. Um, but equally, if you're 
down the road from a waste fire that's burning things like plastics and tires, then that's really not good for your health either. Is this is also from 3J? They said, Is metal found at the bottom of the ocean? See, I'm not doing very well on these, am I? I, I, I don't know. I'm afraid. <laughs> you guys always think of really good questions <laughs> that we've never thought of before. It's amazing. <laughs> Do you find metal at the bottom of the ocean? Yeah, no idea. Sorry, we didn't <laughs> find any. Guys, you've done it again. You have stumped the scientists. This is great. <laughs> Do you have any more questions for the seasonal Megan? No? Wow, I'm going to say a big thank you so much, Megan and Susan. Um, it was really, really amazing to have you. Thank you so much for doing it. And it was so interesting. I really love that is metal found at the bottom of the ocean question. So I might send that off to some people and see if we can find that out as well. Um, you had some really great questions um, today, guys. So thank you so, so much for joining us. 3J say thank you. It was very interesting. Thank you, 3J, for joining us. Bye, guys.